Good morning everybody and welcome to Safari Live on our Sunrise Safari. My name is Byron. On camera this morning I have David with me. We've got James and Brian on the other vehicle and Kirsten and Lou in the FC with us. Welcome to the Greater Kruger National Park. We are in an area known as Juma Game Reserve and this morning we have got a very very big surprise for you. We had a lot of activity around last night. Lions calling and look what we have found. The two big male lions that are feeding on a buffalo carcass that they must have killed during the evening around half past 10, 11 o'clock last night, our time. Just a reminder, we are completely live. What we are seeing, you are seeing as it happens. Don't forget to ask us questions. Send us questions via Twitter with hashtag Safari Live or email us questions at wildearth.tv and we will happily glad or we will happily answer those questions for you. These lines have been calling all morning, they were really, really early from early on, making a lot of noise. I think there were some lionesses around here too. I haven't seen them yet. Often males will chase lionesses away from a kill if they have if they have killed something and the reason for that is they're a little bit bigger, more dominant. And they will try and feed on whatever the lionesses have killed. They will allow the lionesses to feed at some stage, but I don't see where those lionesses are. Perhaps they got to feed during the course of the evening and have just moved on. Possibly in the area. Listen carefully, that male's growling every now and then. The reason for that is Oh, listen, we might get some, a line call. Just a lot of growling and the reason for that is the brother, just behind the tree to the left of that line, has moved. Even though they are brothers, they're still very aggressive around a kill. I don't want to share their meat, it's survival of the fittest. Listen to that deep growl, warning his brother not to come any closer. That is his piece of meat and he does not want to share it. The other male got up and it sounded as if he was going to call. He gave a little low contact call, just a ooh, and I thought perhaps he may start calling that beautiful roar. But it doesn't look like it. I think he was just trying to see if there's any any piece of meat for him. The other male seem to have moved off a little bit, so this one is quietened down and is just chewing on that piece of meat. It appears as if they killed a young buffalo. Again, I'm not too sure if it was the males that killed it, or if it was in fact the females that were in the area. There were apparently reports of a lioness or two seen in this area last night and early this morning. But as I said, I can't seem to see them anywhere, but I haven't really driven around this, this area completely. We, as we got down the road, we saw the males uh, very close to the road, out in the open. Beautiful, beautiful males. Look at that golden mane. So Leslie from California asked if I didn't hear them during the evening 
um, or if I slept through the roars. No, Leslie, I definitely heard them. They, they were calling a lot through the night. And because they were so close, it was a, it was a wonderful sound. That lion roar to me is just one of the best sounds in the bush. Really is an amazing sound. I definitely did hear them, Leslie. And early this morning they were calling. I said to James as we got out, I said, those lions sound very close. And we were right. We're not too far from the camp. I'm going to sit here with these lions for a while, see if the lionesses aren't in the area. Let's get an update from my good friend James this morning. Let him say good morning and see what he is up to. You won't believe it, everybody. Good morning to you. I hope you're all in fine fettle. What a morning we've had so far. There is a little leopard cub just up ahead. Karula and her babies are around here. We'll just get you a view of the little cub through here. I haven't seen mum. Don't know where she is. If you are joining us for the first time, you've joined on a perfect day. My name is James Henry. Brian is on camera. There's the little cub in front of us. It's just stalking gently through the bush there. And... We are a bit reticent to go too close because we don't know if the mother's here or where she is. So you can just see the little cubby moving there. I'll sneak slowly forward. We have to keep our distance because if mum isn't here, she will be a bit nervous. But there we've seen the little cub. They had a kill around here last night. And whether she still has the kill or not, I don't know. There's the little cub moving there. Just looking quite nervous, so we're going to wait here for a little while and see if we can't pick up the others. It's another game drive in the area. Anyway, we're as live as Byron is. Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. Just one cub moving down through there. I was just telling Lex there what's going on. So let's move slowly forward. Just going to ease our way forward. It, it's quite possible that Karula is lying down here somewhere, perhaps in the drainage line. But what an amazing start. Lions on buffalo kill. And now little baby leopard. I know you got a glimpse, but perhaps not, but perhaps not quite the uh, extent of the sighting you'd hoped for. But maybe we'll be lucky. Because the little ones just popped into that thicket there. And I'm not going to go bashing around in there unless I know that mum is around. So we'll just ease our way around. There it is. It's moving through there. She's just moving there. There you can just see the movement. This is characteristic of mum not being here. So the little one's kind of coming out and playing a little bit. And then when they're disturbed, like unfortunately we are disturbing them, that's okay, we're not harming them. Then they do tend to go into cover if mum isn't around. Now, Karula, of course, has been ranging very far and wide of late, marking territory, re-establishing the territory that was unmarked uh, during the time when her cubs were sort of in the den. Lex, I can only see the one cub here. I don't think the mother's here. I'll just quickly check in the drainage here. I'm just going to go around here. Okay, copy, thanks. So Lex is just saying there, unless he hears the mother is here, he won't come in. And that's great practice. Of course, we don't want to pressure these cubs. Just very gently ease our way in here. Brian pulled off the spot, everybody, of the little cub. Very good spot. Now, she killed last night, and uncharacteristically for her, there was a tree that she could have pulled it into. Maybe it was a little dike or something, and I think they fed on it on the ground. I also think that these little ones are, don't like feeding in the, in the tree. I think they prefer to feed on the ground, and I think that's why she didn't hoist it. But if the cubs are still here, it means that they were not disturbed last night by, say, hyenas, which could have come through here and taken the kill. No 
Okay, it's just in front of us there. You see that? Well spotted. An Aaron in New Zealand. You want to know these cubbies are going to are old enough to start catching prey on their own. Aaron, yes, I would say they are. Very small things like you suggest, lizards, perhaps the odd bush felt gerbil, and maybe some termites and things. That's the little male, I think. Would you agree, Brian? The blue-eyed male, or bluish-eyed male. So that's George. Charlotte is a little bit more confiding normally, and I'm sure she's in these thickets somewhere. But where Mum is, I don't know. Mum could easily be lying down in the drainage line here, just having a bit of a rest. It's fantastic, isn't that lovely? Just looking forward there. Maybe Mum's inside there. Let's just enjoy little, little George for a while. We're not doing any harm at the moment, so we can be here. We just assess the situation and decide eventually if Karula's here. We have had one sighting of him without his mum before, um, and he was pretty relaxed. But we won't sort of push vehicles through the area if the mother isn't here. Just see a bit of movement down in the drainage to the right-hand side there. Look, just creeping through there in the most cat, whoops, cat-like fashion. Um, Michael, nice question from you. You want to know if we, you, you reckon Charlotte's got a wow-like pattern like her mum's, and that's on the forehead, everybody. And you say, do I use you these unique spot patterns or the whisker spot patterns mostly? Um, Michael? I use the whisker spot patterns. I haven't noticed Charlotte's wow, but once, of course, Karula's wow was pointed out to me, it was so obvious that now I do absolutely use it. But for me, it's normally the whisker spot patterns. Our next little visual of only one youngster. We're not going to move from this position. So Lex, I think, is going to make his way out, unless we can give him an indication that Mum is here. But little George there is ranging. Hey, Brian, he's walked about 40 meters. Let's just see if he doesn't lead us to his mother. Isn't he perfect? <laughs> he's so cool. <laughs> I wonder if Mum isn't the other side there. Have you still got him there, Brian? Yeah, I'm still moving there. Oh, yes. Just see the little bit of movement past the Tambuti leaves there. I'm just keeping an eye. There we are. Absolutely brilliant, Brian. He's now walked all the way around us, everyone. So you can't quite see it. But he's basically walked. He's basically walked in a sort of 90-degree arc. He's walked through that little drainage line, and straight around us. And now he's looking at us. Georgie, where's your family? Let's just see if we can. I don't know that that is George. my binoculars now into the bushes beyond. And then Michael, of course, apart from just the apart from just the spots, you can do things like look at the nose colour, you can look at the eye colour like I'm doing with this one. All right, we're going to wait and see what happens here. Let's quickly go across back to Byron. There's so much action at the moment. The sunrise, the beautiful lions. Go and take a look.
That's right, James. Beautiful sunrise at the moment. Look at this. Really incredible. And 100% right. There's so much action. I can't believe James has got leopard cubs there. He's going to wait around and hopefully the female pops out. You might get to see all of them this morning. And while he's got that, we've got the lions. What an incredible morning. So much going on. And it just shows you, you never know what's going to happen. Yesterday we drove around, we searched for ages for any signs of predators, any lions, any leopard, and we didn't have too much luck. And then you wake up one morning and very close to camp, lions and leopards in the area. It's fantastic. This one male is still feeding on this buffalo carcass. It looked like a young buffalo, not a very big carcass at all. But he's still growling every now and then. His brother is just behind him, just behind those trees. And... He is not interested in sharing his kill at all, or his food. I'm sure the other male would have possibly fed on something a bit earlier, but it looks like this male has got the most of the kill at the moment and is not sharing. So I can hear there is a lioness that we can see from the dam cam. So as I said, I think those lionesses must have made the kill and these males came in and took what was left away from them and started to feed. So there's at least one lioness around here. I'm sure the others are around too. I'm glad you're able to see them from the dam camp. So Maggie from Western Australia has heard these lions growling and roaring. And Maggie has asked, do they hiss like domestic cats? And they do not. They don't hiss like domestic cats. They also do not purr. The only big cat which purrs is a cheetah. That is the only cat, big cat which purrs. Lion and leopard do not. They've got these very deep voice boxes and they have a lot of cartilage within the voice box which creates that deep roaring sound and growling sound so not like domestic cats at all when it comes to vocalizations you can just see the ear of the other male <laughs> just there or you can just see the face a little bit look at that just behind the behind that bush He's been sneaking closer and my guess is perhaps these males only found the lionesses with this kill early this morning and came in tried to get whatever food they could and this male has taken most of it and maybe that other male hasn't had a lot to eat yet but may get a piece hopefully once his brother decides he has had enough but lions when they do feed they gorge themselves they eat as much as they possibly can. Literally until they cannot eat anymore, they will move off, lie in the shade, especially if the kill is large and they can feed on it for a few days. They will lie in the shade somewhere, rest during the day, get up and eat every so often when they are hungry. But they will eat until there is literally nothing left. See how he's licking the kill. And lions do that. They've got a very... <laughs> look at that belly. <laughs> Quite a full belly already. So lions... Oh, look. At... He's trying to move it a little further away from his brother. Around the bush. Oh, look. Amazing. So lions, as I was saying, while he was licking that kill, they've got a very, very rough tongue. Often they will lick carcasses or kills to get rid of the hair or open the carcass a little bit. Watch the other one is coming straight in. Look at that. I wonder what caused that male to get up and move so quickly. Perhaps he saw a lioness or he, he heard something.
I'm going to do is this male has just this male has just gone down to start feeding. I just want to follow that other male quickly. Let's just see where he goes. We can always come back to this one. But what a beautiful morning. Oh, this is great and very exciting. Let's have a look. Perhaps that male <clears throat> spotted one of the lionesses around or heard them. And he's gone to join them. I don't think this male will move away from here for a while. There's still quite a bit of meat there. So he will enjoy it. So let's see what we've got. Uh, I see a lioness. I can see, and that male is heading straight towards her. Here we go. Dropping some dung. <clears throat> I'm going to try and get both <clears throat> in the shot for you, the lioness and the this male. Oh dear. That is not going to smell too good. <clears throat> but have a look at how that lioness is lying down in the back. It is a little cold, so it looks like she's trying to warm up, but she was a little weary when this male approached her. And even though I'm sure these lionesses and males have met up a number of times, they are still very, very cautious of males. And let's see the behavior. The reason for that is males can be quite aggressive, and they are obviously a, quite a bit more powerful than the females. So the females are always just very careful, always hesitant when these big males come into their territory or into the area. Males like this often will try and see if the females are in estrus whenever they meet up to see if they can mate with them. There's a beautiful, beautiful lion. Look at that mane. Just incredible. See a bit of scent marking. Look at him scraping, scraping the ground. He may urinate there, and that's exactly what he's doing now. He scratched the ground to urinate because often what happens is that sand, which is then uncovered, may hold the scent a little bit longer but I think he's definitely done it because that lioness is in the area and this just helps my theory in that oh, sorry I just got a whiff of lion <laughs> not a great smell at all um, Anyway, I was getting back to my theory in that I think these males stole the kill from these lionesses. That's possibly why one or two. But look how he's scent marking there again. Rubbing up against the bush. While this lion scent marks, James has found Karula and she's in an interesting position. How awesome is this, everybody? In the dawn light, Karula with a Steenbok male that unfortunately had a very bad evening last night. But for the Karu for Karula and her little cubs, they are having the best, best time here. That's the other cub, that must be Charlotte, unless I've misidentified them. And hoping to get a bit of a meal. Now she's moved these things quite a long way, you know, from where we first found them last night. Oh, this is special. And I'm sure little George, he's, co he's coming from, he's probably about 100 meters away, you know, maybe not quite, maybe 50 meters. 
at this little drainage line where the tree is. So he's ranging quite far and wide away from his mum. But isn't this the most perfect morning? Lions, buffalo kill, bad night for the buffalo, and steenbok kill, bad night for the steenbok, and two of our most precious, precious characters, Karula and her little cubby. So great. We were just about to leave the area. We drove along the drainage line here. And as I looked up, Lex said, stop, I can hear chewing. <laughs> and I looked up, and there she was. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> ah. Brian, all is right with the world, wouldn't you say? Well, everybody, I hope you're enjoying our little dawn safari here with live leopard cub, live leopard mum, and other leopard cub potentially arriving. Now, Elizabeth, you want to know how old these cubs are and whether they're the size of a house cat. Elizabeth, they are going to be five months on the 2nd of July. They are bigger than a house cat now, and you wouldn't believe the size of the little paw prints they leave. They're about the size, what do you say, of a Scottish terrier, uh, that sort of size dog, uh, maybe a white Highland terrier, like that sort of thing. So they're a little bit bigger than a house cat. They're certainly more solid, and they've got big feet. Their feet are not much smaller than their mums at this stage. And so a house cat, I think you probably find what, where they weigh about eight kilos, perhaps, 20 pounds. Um, I think these little chaps will probably be into the region of 10 kilograms, 11, maybe 12 kilos. Wonderful stuff. And we're just about to wait for the sun. Is The sun is going to catch her now. It's coming up just behind her. And she's about to be bathed in the most perfect golden light. Ah, yes, very nice. Justin, welcome back again. Lovely to have you with us this morning. You say, why is there a white top to the leopard's tail? Justin, there's a white top because when they follow each other through the bushes, especially when she's got little cubs like this, it's difficult for them to see each other. And that white tail tip, like so many sort of white bits at the end of animals, is a following mechanism. But at the same time, and this is a little bit more controversial because you won't read it in a book, but you will definitely see it. Uh, when a bird alarm calls, when a leopard, say Karula, goes on a territorial marking spree, or she's hunting Stienbock like this, when a bird sees her, it will often start alarm calling. And what the leopards do is they kind of flick the tail up as a sign of surrender, almost like a white flag, saying, I'm not after you. And we have this, the birds almost always then go silent, or they certainly lose their enthusiasm for alarm calling. I'm just going to tell Aubrey what's going on. Morning, Orbs. Um, there's a pride of lions on a buffalo kill just south of Yuri's house, and Karula and cubs on site just to the east of Mvubu Road, south of the junction with the shortcut to the Gallagher Pan. One station at the Lions, two stations here at Kurula. Space for one. So I was just updating Aubrey there. Aubrey operates out of Gallego Camp. Uh, not Gallego Camp, yeah, we'll use Gallego at the moment, and that's one of the beautiful camps here at Juma. And were you to come and visit us here, you could stay in one of those camps, and you too 
could have the best kind of morning here with two of Africa's most perfect animals. Now, E.B. Murphy, you want to know if the cubs will feed together? Absolutely they will, E.B. The only reason they're not feeding together right now is that the little one, I think, has probably eaten his fill, and now he's just kind of getting, a, he got a bit bored, and so he's been ranging around the place. I think that's why he's not here, but I think he's going to come up soon. And like I say, I haven't seen them feeding in a tree before. This would be the first time. They've, she normally, or she often leaves the kill on the floor for them for a while, and then she hoists, I think, to eat herself. But this little one you can see is quite hungry, and I think is probably a little bit wary of pushing mum too far. Ah, oh, it's wonderful. Look how patient she is. Definitely the female cub. <laughs> Male likely to be far less patient than that. Um, just keep looking behind us towards the rising sun, which has bathed the land in gold and yellow now. And I'm wondering if little George won't scuttle along the drainage line and decide to come through for some meal, because that would be very special. You see how she looked down there at the ground? I wonder if the other cub isn't approaching, hasn't snuck in without our notice. Brian, would you like me to sh shift forward a little bit? Let me just see if I can get a slightly better shot. I'm actually thinking of going all the way around there, Brian. What do you think? Okay, we're just going to move everybody. She's not going anywhere. So we're just going to go around and see if we can't get into that position there where the, she's not quite so obscured by all the branches. So the lions are still there, and Brian, Byron is just doing what we call a VR. Are we okay there? A VR segment, which is that you've seen that ball of GoPros on the front of the vehicle. And they're just doing one of those segments. But while we've got beautiful Karula, I don't know how long we're going to be able to stay here. Because I'm pretty sure that once everybody starts moving around, they're going to come into this area. So we're going to milk this for all we can, while we can. And for those of you who are new viewers, it's wonderful to have you with us. Of course, we don't have a morning like this every morning, do we? Uh, at the same time, uh, we don't want to overpressurize the animals, so there's never more than three vehicles in a sighting, sometimes only two with sensitive sightings, but because Karula's here with her cubs and they're in a tree with the kill, uh, we've put three vehicles in. Ah, here we go. This is going to be a good one. How's that, Brian? Uh, a comment from someone called the Queen of Juma. So I'm not sure when this Twitter came through because I haven't seen Karula on her phone this morning. Uh, the Queen of Juma, you say you would invite me for dinner, but you're worried that I would fall out of the tree. Queen of Juma, thank you for your concern. Um, I fear me you shouldn't worry that I'll fall out of the tree. I would like to reiterate uh, that when I had my small accident two days ago, I didn't in fact fall out of the tree so much as just fall to a lower position in the same tree. Fell down the tree. It's not the same, yes, exactly. Fell down the tree. Well, everybody, it doesn't get much more quintessential than that. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm just think, listening to Lex there, and I think he's got, he's got it bang on. He says he reckons 
that she probably pulled this thing up the tree when the lions came past. She would have heard them coming past. She would have heard the buffalo meeting its rather nasty end. And she probably then moved this kill up into the tree. And the cubs may or may not have gone with her. But I think they probably would have. I'm surprised she didn't put this thing up in a tree yesterday, uh, straight away. I don't really know why that she wouldn't have. Jared, a nice one from you about whether or not Karula or the cubs, should a hyena pitch up, would the cubs have sufficient stamina to stay in the tree? Uh, absolutely, Jared. I mean, they can sleep up there. She's completely relaxed there. She's not in that in the slightest. And the other one, I think, I mean, I genuinely think the other one is probably bored. I think he had his fill and he just did, went on a little ranging mission. She's very patiently waiting for Mum to let her eat something. Oh, this is just too special, isn't it? The sun, you can see, is catching her the other side. The other side there, the other, you can maybe just really, we, we can perhaps hear the other vehicle is, is, um, is actually almost impossible to, to get a, a shot of her face there. So that's why we came around here, but we can move around at some stage and we'll see if we don't get a better view. Was the little one moving there? Brian, I'm going to try another slight sneak forward and see if you don't... I think you're going to get a slightly better view from there. There we go. How's that? There we go. Perfect. <laughs> that is lovely. And I know it's a little bit grim, but that, um, that sight there of the blood red and the tree is quite something. Now thinking about coming out, the little one. <laughs> so, Jared, you can see there, I mean, that's probably not a particularly comfortable spot for it to be. But when the last time we found George and Charlotte when they were on their own, she was on the ground sitting on a termite mound, and he was in a tree, he was sleeping in a tree. So they can very comfortably sleep in the tree. Well, I don't know how very comfortable it is, but they can sleep in a tree. She's looking at something. I think she's just keeping an eye on things. Oh, nice, uh, nice question, Jen B. You want to know how high up in the tree they are. Um, let's ask Brian to show us where the vehicle is below them. But they're about, they're about three and a half to four meters up. There we go. <laughs> so that's about 12 to 13 feet up into the top of the tree. You can just get an idea there from where they're sitting. Now their view, I'm afraid, of the... Is that the cub? Is that the cub, right? Oh! <laughs> he just hit the cub on the head with a Stienbock leg. I thought the cub was going... <laughs> Just here, uh, you see, she's actually looking around. I wonder if that other little one isn't sneaking up towards us through the drainage. Maybe he'll climb up the tree. And you can see how the sky behind her is now already turning that kind of burnt out white color. That's because the sun has risen, it's basically backlighting her. Here comes the little one now, coming down. This is fantastic. Come 
one. Look over here, little one. That's it. So sweet. Let's see what she does. I think she's got tired of waiting for mum to give her a gap at the table. And like Lex says there, I don't know if you've heard him, he says maybe going down to find a place to rest. So I mean, while they will be in the tree, the tree is not the most comfortable place, I suppose. I just wonder where the other one is. I think if we sit here for long enough, you'll find he'll pitch up. There we go. Just lovely. Hey, we are so lucky. So, so lucky. Their mum's calling. Have you heard that? Oh. I'm taking a number of very horrific photographs. You're all getting a beautiful picture. Oh, no, back up again. See, I think Mum called there and said, where are you going? Come and have something to eat. You need to keep your strength up, my dear. Now she's eating. She looks like she's going to be. I'm not, I haven't got quite the same view that you do. Oh, look, 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 look. This is fantastic. That's so special. Oh, wow. All right, we don't really know where to look, everybody, but at the pan, having a drink, are the lions. What an incredible morning. Leopard cubs, the female in the tree with the kill, and we've got the got this beautiful male now drinking. This was the male that we saw first who was feeding on the on that buffalo carcass. When lions feed they do get very thirsty afterwards. And the reason for that is there's a lot of salt in the blood of, of their prey. So they do get quite thirsty and they would love to come and drink very soon after feeding. Luckily for these lions, the water hole is close by. Just watch him drinking. Watch how he's lapping up that water. Now, I think he may be here for quite some time. The reason for that is lions generally don't pick up a lot of water with each lick. Their tongue curls back and they lap up little bits of water with each lick or lap. So they don't get a lot every time they do that. So they'll stay down there and drink for quite some time until they've quenched that thirst. Those beautiful eyes. Okay, those leopards sound like they're coming down a tree. Go have a look there quickly. Karula's down, George has just arrived, and here comes Charlotte down the tree now. We're going to get all three of them together. Isn't that fantastic? Let's see if they all join her. Oh, this is just too wonderful for words, look. Leopards climb trees very elegantly. Their ability to come down them, though, is not dissimilar to my own. Oh, look at the little babies, little one going up. This is fantastic. Come on, Georgie, go have, a, go have your breakfast, boy. That's very independent of him, you know. He did the last time they had a kill together. George also went off on his own, to feed on his own. Now, Charlotte has gone into the drainage on her own. And Karula just sitting there having a bit of a clean in front of Lex. <laughs> Difficult to know where to look. 
even just this one sighting. Oh, Georgie boy is looking straight at us from the top of the tree there. Shane, nice one from you. Obviously, you can see that the Stienbock is substantially larger than George. And you want to know how long it will be before they'll be able to pull something like that into the tree a long time. Shane, I don't think they'll start hoisting kills uh, by the smallest kind of mongoose, maybe, uh, before they're a year old. It really just does depend, I suppose, though, on the strength that they have and their relative ability to... Um, well, they're, they're, yeah, they're, you know, their relative strength. So he'll probably start pulling things up a tree as soon as he's able to. I mean, look at the strength there. That's not, that's not a, that's pretty impressive strength. Look at him. That's so cool. <laughs> People, we are so lucky here. And you can see the sun starting to blaze. There, Charlotte's back with the little one, yes. So pretty. Ah. <laughs> uh. I think it's quite interesting, don't you, that there seems to be a slightly uh, closer relationship between mum and daughter than there does between mum and son. If I've identified them correctly, and I'm pretty sure I have. Oh, she's looking up, thinking, don't finish it all, Georgie boy. Oh, here she goes. And she's going to go back up. Michael, very nice question from you about at what age I think the size difference between the cubs and the mum will change. At, not the cubs and the mum, the cubs and each other. So one's male, one's female. What time, when will we be able to see that? Michael, you know, when I first saw them, one was noticeably smaller than the other. The female was noticeably smaller than the male. And I don't know if that is still the case. I certainly can't, you know, unless you see them right next to each other, I don't think that you can tell the difference between the sizes. So, I mean, much like with human beings, Michael, I think you'll find that the size difference will become most apparent when they hit puberty. And puberty, they will hit sort of at the end of a year. Once they hit a year old, I think it'll be a no very noticeable which one's the male and which one's the female. At about a year old, the male will be bigger than his mother. And then he will def almost certainly be bigger than his sister, unless his sister is unusually large. Oh, brilliant stuff. She's just keeping a very weary eye. All right, while we wait and see what happens here, let's just quickly go and get an update from Byron and his lions. I ain't going nowhere. This male has just finished drinking and have a look. He's posing beautifully for us. You can just see the breath coming out of his mouth as he's breathing there. It's still quite cool this morning. See that? Just a little bit of vapor coming out of the, the mouth of the line or the nose. He's just lying off to the distance. The one lioness and the other male are still in this area. The other male is still feeding on the carcass. There's not much left at all, but there's just such beautiful light on that male. Have a look off to our left here, there we go, there's the other male, 
still feeding, and the lioness is just to the right. Oh, she's giving her a little yawn over there. There she is. She's just hiding. Again, I think she wanted to try and get some more food or meat, but these males, I don't think, would let her feed until they are completely finished. <laughs> what a morning, so much happening, so much going on. It's a beautiful winter's morning. This sun is rising faster and faster. It's quite high up already. And it's starting to warm us up a little bit. Look at that male. Beautiful. See, he's got a little bit of blood on his paws from the, the kill that he was feeding on. And he's just cleaning himself. So Michael has asked us a question, how many or how long or how much time do lions, males, in coalitions spend apart? Or how much time do they spend apart? So Michael, that's very difficult to say. The reason for that is because these males, and I'm assuming these are two brothers, I think they are, I think they're known as the Birmingham males. And these two males together would have a much larger territory. So when they are patrolling, generally they do patrol together, and if they get to a kill, often that is together. But they may split up at times if they are potentially looking to mate with females from different prides, or if they are patrolling different parts of their territory, they may split up. It's very difficult to give an accurate answer as to how much time they spend apart. And I have seen generally perhaps an average maybe two to three days out of a week now potentially apart but again it all depends it depends if they have a kill um, or have they met up with the pride of lions where the females where one or two females are on estrus then both males will try and mate with those females then they may stay together for longer periods of time but generally they always know where the other one is. They will call in the evenings knowing that exactly where the other one is and to warn other lions that they are in the territory, that this is their territory and that they must stay out. So it's tough to say, Michael, exactly how long or how much time they spend apart, but, but they, always, they always meet up and do spend a lot of time together. We're going to sit with these lions for a while longer and while this one eats over here, James has got a cub eating. Hello everybody at Rodine in the Grade Nought. I think you've joined us, is that correct Kirsten? No, you haven't joined yet. I will start to talk normally again. Uh, here we are <laughs> with Karula and her little cub. and. She's not moved, actually. She's still sitting down there. We just shifted slowly down towards the drainage line a little bit so that we could get a slightly better angle. Not sure we've achieved that, but we have got better lighting slightly. And so I think we're just going to sit here for a little while and see what transpires. Not sure where Charlotte is. Charlotte seems to have gone down into the drainage line. She's probably lying down in some soft leaf litter. Well, he eats on the little bits of stem book that there are there. Just look at the strength and the dexterity and the incredible balance that he has. So, I mean, it, it really is quite astounding that he's able to achieve that. The tree, I'm afraid, has got so many branches in all the wrong places, so we can't really see him actually feeding but it's still too fantastic. I think, oh, there, Brian, I don't know if you'll be sighted, but just through the bushes there, 
with Charlotte. You might be slightly unsighted there. There we are, just to the left. Yeah, right there. You, that's her. Believe it or not, everybody. Just that little dark patch that you can see. I can ease forward, but I think we're going to lose. Let me just try and see. There, you'll get in now. She's just through there. Can you see her? Yeah, I'm not going to go any further forward, everyone. But Charlotte is there. There's Mum cleaning her little paws. Derek, a very good question from you. Are they still drinking milk? Derek, no, they're absolutely not drinking milk at the moment. They finished that when they were about three months old. They're nearly five months old now. So they might be trying every so often to see if they can drink some milk, but no, they're not allowed to drink milk at this stage. And so they will become very hungry for meat. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh. And you can't believe the action going on everywhere at the moment. Uh, we've got our lions, of course, they've killed a buffalo. There's a buffalo being killed on Cheetah Plains as well, a Cheetah Plains pan. So, I mean, there really is a massive amount of action going on here. Oh, too fantastic for words. Oh, look at the strength. She's pick he's picking up something at least, I, I reckon, three times his weight. That is unbelievable. I've never seen that before. And X-Blade, you say, how strong are these leopards that they can carry their prey into a tree? Well, the answer, X-Blade, is very strong. Um, in theory, able to take something that they double their own body weight into a tree. And I think certainly that Steenbock cannot weigh less than twice what George weighs. I'm just going to talk on the radio quickly. Orbs, there's space for one here. Um, I will move out as soon as uh, there are four vehicles in the area. So I'm just organizing on the game drive radio there, everybody. Everyone's now starting to move around the place, so people will want to move in and have a look here. if he wouldn't move the steering book so that we could see his face. That would be the best. I wish you could see the other little one just poking through the bushes there, but it's just not possible for me to move into a position where you can. Very sweet. You see it there, Brian? <laughs> there she is. There you can see the ear, everybody. Look, there we are. <laughs> and look at the colours, the gold of the leopard, the black and the white, a little bit of red on the leaves and the green, all shining in the new light of the day. Just so perfect. Now, Photo Hutch, you want to know how often it is that she has to kill? Well, as with most of the answers as to how often things need to eat, it's basically depending on what she does. So this skin book, I don't know, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry, I just had to move my scarf, everybody was in the way. This leopard, at least the skin book, will probably last them, I would say, about four days before they'll need to eat again. 
if she can kill again, she absolutely will kill again. And they are known leopards for keeping caches. So they keep caches of animals um, sometimes. So if she can kill, she will. But she won't necessarily try again for the next four days or so. I cannot believe the strength in that little leopard. I'm really I'm astounded. There's quite a lot of meat left there, hey Brian. That really is truly impressive. We're just going to sit right here, and I know it maybe looks like Lex has got a better view where he is, but he doesn't. He's unsighted by lots and lots of bushes in the way. I knew it may be... All right, let's, we're going to sit here. We're not going to go anywhere. Let's go across to uh, Brent. At least not Brent. What's his name again, Brian? Byron. Byron. Let's go across to, <laughs> to Byron and find out how those lions are enjoying their beefalo. Full action morning here at Safari Live. Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, uh, J James, uh, sorry, what? Anyway, whatever, James. Don't forget my name. Um, we're still sitting with these lions. We've got that lioness hiding through the back there, watching closely while this male is feeding. Still just the one male feeding. The other one just moved off a little bit and lay down. He's full, he's got, had some water, so very happy, and this male seems to be finishing what is left of this carcass. I'm sure if he has enough though, the lioness will try and get a little bit of food. She's standing close by now. She's got up and moved a little bit closer. Such an amazing morning. So much going on right around or within a kilometer. Or James and I are within a kilometer of each other, very close to each other. And everything's happening here. It's amazing. is just lying down but you see again she's very very cautious of this male she does not want to upset him because they can get very aggressive when there's food around and often lions will fight with each other and especially a male lion he does not want to give up that piece of meat that he's got even though I think these lionesses made the kill I don't think James or I are going to go anywhere for the next little while. There's just so much happening here. Incredible to see lions, leopards with cubs. Glad James's tracking skills have improved since yesterday. <laughs> he was a little worried when he first got to the area where he thought Karula was, he said he's not too sure where she is. Looks as if she has moved off. And shortly afterwards, he managed to find the cub and then her with the other cub. So I'm very happy about that. Otherwise, he may have been a little grumpy this morning. We were lucky. We heard these lions calling throughout the, the, the night and early this morning. And we had, had a good idea of where to start looking and... Fortunately for us, they were out in the open and these two males were feeding and then the other one has just moved off. 
Just goes to show, you know, yesterday morning I was tracking, looking for lions and leopard, and we tracked for, for a good two hours and we didn't have any luck. And then other mornings you could come out like we did this morning, and you bump straight into whatever it is you might be looking for. Happens like that. You can never be sure of what you're going to see or what's going to happen. And that's the exciting thing about this. Being on safari in Africa is, is very much a, a guessing game or a, a, a little bit of luck I think is involved. And patience, those two always pay off. Oh, a little sneeze. <laughs> This is, oh, you see, a little bit of a growl there, a little bit aggressive towards that lioness. She's getting a little too close. So, Holly Bonner has asked, would this lioness drag some of this kill back towards the cubs? Holly Bonner, I'm not sure which lionesses these are, um, I'm sure, it potentially the, um, I've forgotten the name of the pride now. Unkuhuma. Unkuhuma pride, thanks David. Unkuhuma pride. I'm not too sure which, which one of the lionesses has cubs at the moment. Or we saw one the other night that we thought is possibly going to give birth very soon. She looked very pregnant. But generally, if lionesses have cubs, they do not drag the kill back to the cubs. What the lionesses would do, what the lionesses would do is they would go off, fetch the cubs and bring them to the kill so that they may feed. We're gonna sit with these lionesses a little bit long, longer. Cross over to James for an update on those leopards and cubs. Very kind of Byron to um, say that my my tracking skills have improved. I'm I'm going to claim that. Of course, it was very hard tracking these things this morning, wasn't it, Brian? Mm, yeah. Them. Them. Yes, <laughs> but that's the way things, Brian. We take the credit. You do the work. That's hard works. We are the heroes. Yes. Now everybody, I am afraid that lots and lots of people are starting to move down in this direction. So I'm not sure how long we're going to be able to be here. So let's just enjoy while we can. Mm. Perfect. Perfect, perfect little scene. And Charlotte, here comes Charlotte. She's starting to move towards us. Uh, what we really want, of course, is all three of them the same shot. And no one shouldn't be fussy, but one cannot help it at times. And Anna Marie, a very valid question from you. You're saying, how far away from the hyena den are we? Anna Marie, about a quarter of a mile? No, less. Maybe 300 meters. Yeah, almost a quarter of a mile. Uh, it's sort of behind where you're sitting. And so I don't think any real danger here, simply because I think it's only that one hyena that's there. I don't think the rest are there. See, they can hear the other one coming. Here she comes. I'm just going to quickly get my binoculars out and make sure I haven't misidentified these things. Now that's George and Charlotte apparently coming up through the bushes. You can notice that from two things. First, the fact that they're looking down into the bushes and second, the rapid machine gun fire of one of the cameras on Lex's vehicle. Here we go, here we go. There she is. Oh, sweet. <laughs> hey, isn't that wonderful? Oh, that's precious.
precious, precious stuff. Now, maybe she'll go back up the tree. I suspect she may well. Can't see where she's gone, can you, Brian? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, of course you can. I see that you see. Oh, she's close to the base of the tree there. Ah, yes. Look at that brilliant camouflage. You can see how you would never hope to see that. Sneaking through the bush there is Georgie. And he's gone off into the drainage line there. I was hoping he might come towards us. And what the other little cubby's going to do, they're probably going to just snooze for a while around here. But don't you think it's interesting how they're ranging away from their mum? More and more independence being shown. Here she comes again. Here we are. Now going towards the kill. And I can't. There we go. <laughs> it's just fantastic. <laughs> See how they're totally invisible unless they're moving? Oh, I think that's absolutely amazing. Look at them. And you see, they're much less playful than lion cubs at the same age. They are playful, but they're not in the same way. Hello, Natasha in Ontario. You're wondering how fast a little baby like this is able to run. Natasha? Um, uh, not very fast, uh, probably about the same sort of speed as a, uh, I mean, I guess a dog at the same size. So, I mean, faster than us, off the mark, certainly, but they won't have a huge lot, amount of stamina. They'll be very quick to jump into a tree. So, I, look, I imagine about the speed of a house cat, let's say the speed of a house cat, with a, a lot more strength, but less you know, their, their muscles and their nerves and their bones and their ligaments and their tendons are not all fully formed. And so they would probably um, be relatively quick for a little while, but they're going to get a huge amount faster. What a joy. Utterly, utterly invisible. And I can just hear her going, I can hear the little ones going. <coughs> yeah, Georgia and I, this is why I'm also getting a little bit confused. You're saying have Charlotte's eyes lightened up a bit because they both look like they've got quite light eyes. And I have to, I have to agree with you. There's mum. Come to give them a bit of a clean. Make sure that they don't have any Stienbock guts on them. It's very important that, Brian. You can't let your children have Stienbock guts on them. No, no, don't. Very important lesson Karula teaching us here. Gets That's good. Well done. Excellent. I don't think we can move from here, everyone. Um, might be able to stick our noses in there. Uh, what do you think? I think we should. I'm just going to move slightly back, and then we're going to move slightly off to the right. 
try not to rev the car too much. While I reposition and try and get a great picture, let's head back to the Lions. With, uh, what's it? Brent. Brent. If James calls me Brent, once more he's going to find himself in some serious trouble. We're still sitting with these lions though. The male is still feeding. He's really enjoying that little bit of kill, the little bit of a kill that is left. Just a little bit of meat there. Oh, look at that. That lioness still having no luck getting any scraps, but she will be very patient and wait. Perhaps she's lucky and sees something or gets a piece. The sun is warming us up nicely now. It's becoming very relaxing sitting here watching these lions. I was trying to tear the meat. <laughs> it's almost like he's full, but he has a piece of meat, so he still wants to feed on so he's just he's not giving up he's just chewing on whatever he can licking it getting as much of that food as he possibly can see lions are so opportunistic they don't know when they're going to eat again so they'll try to feed on as much as possible in as short a space as possible they'll constantly feed until the kill is completely finished before they decide to move on Got that rough tongue going to work on that carcass. L licking and cleaning what's the little bit that's left there. We're going to stay with these lions some more. Go back to James and the leopards. See what they're up to. Okay, everybody, we've just come here to say goodbye to them. The two little cubbies have gone down into the drainage line. Uh, Mike from Cheetah Plains is going to come in here, so we're going to move out. There is Karula. She's going to be here for the next little while. I think that we might well be able to come back in here a little bit later. So bye-bye, Great Queen. Bye-bye, George and Charlotte. We'll see you all a little bit later. All right, let's head back to Gerald and his lion. <laughs> so, what an amazing sighting James had with that female and her two cubs. I'm sure they are going to hang around that area during the course of today, which is great. We are still here with these two male lions and the female. The other male has moved off a little bit into the distance and is lying down. He has had enough to feed, but the lioness and one male still at the carcass, what's left of it. And there's very, very, very little left already. You can imagine with three big lions, and I'm assuming there were more females in this area earlier, that carcass would have been eaten up very quickly and not much of it is left. We are going to be having a group of schoolgirls joining us shortly this morning from Rodine School in Johannesburg. Looking forward to that and the young girls sending through their questions. A great naught class, which should be a lot of fun. It's always great to get questions from these young kids. Very curious and inquisitive about what's going on in nature. And it's wonderful to share what we have with them and what we're seeing. And as I've said that... Welcome, Madam Squirrel and Madam Hedgehog from Rodine School, the Grade Nought class. Wonderful to have you all with us. 
please don't forget to send us your questions. And myself or James, who's unfortunately just left a leopard sighting, him and I will definitely answer your questions. Great to have you girls with us and hope you enjoy what we have got. We've got some lions feeding on a buffalo carcass at the moment. There's a male, big male lion that is finishing up the very little end of the buffalo. It was a young calf that they killed early this morning or, or last night. I think the lionesses made the kill, but these males have come in and they've taken what was left and they have been feeding on it. The other male moved off. He's gone and is laying down at the moment. He was drinking some water earlier and I think he's very, very happy. But his brother is still here feeding. So Justin has asked us how much meat can a lion eat during a day. And Justin, they can eat quite a few kilograms of meat a day, uh, depending on the size of the kill that they've got, obviously. But for a large buffalo, for example, a big male lion could prof probably eat a good 30 to 40 kilograms easily of meat um, in one sitting. That's quite a few pounds. No, but Justin, it's it's tricky to say. I think uh, it does all depend, as I mentioned, the size of the kill, and you know, I've seen I've seen two lions or lionesses devour a impala a full-grown impala within within a few minutes within 15 20 minutes now a full-grown impala is probably around 50 60 kilograms um a, you know really big male if you take the, the the stomach contents out and that they're probably around 40 40 kilograms or so 40 to 50 kilograms and two lionesses devoured that entire carcass within minutes so that's a good 30 20 to 30 kilograms of meat that they each had they will eat that very very easily as i said they gorge themselves they'll feed on so much meat as much as possible until they really can't eat anymore then they will rest if they have a larger carcass they will then return and eat later they won't move very far from the carcass. They'll always stay close by, protecting it from other predators that might try and steal it from them. We're going to stay with these lines a little bit longer. There's still so much going on here, a lot of activity. While I do that, James has got large grey animals to show you. Well, there we have some elephants, everybody, which is a rather marvellous thing. Now, I think for the third time this morning, we're going to welcome the class of grade noughts from a Rhodian school for young girls in Johannesburg. And uh, Madam Squirrel and Madam Hedgehog's classes, you are most welcome. And I'm very glad to have you on back of the drive with us today. I believe little Sienna is in a Madam Squirrel's class. Hello, Sienna. And this is the thumb saying hello to you today. That's the safari thumb with Brian Joubert. He's on camera. My name is James. And for the next little while, we're going to be exploring around what is known as the Kruger National Park. And I'm sure many of you have actually been to the Kruger National Park. I know Sienna's been out here. And we've got some beautiful elephants over here. A whole herd of them. They're all around us. And that one over there is a youngster. And then in the background, you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, there is a huge cow elephant. She's a big female you can see she's got huge tusks and you can see a big, big fat belly out the left hand side of her body there and what you'll probably find is that she's pregnant 
she might be about to have another little baby elephant, which would be very exciting. Now, I don't know if you know how big she is, everyone, but she is bigger than your dad's car. And I'm sure a number of your fathers probably drive those, uh, something like a Prado or something like a, um, a Land Cruiser. She's as big as a Land Cruiser, even bigger than a Land Cruiser, which I think is amazing. Isn't that incredible that nature created something so very big? She's just moving some sticks and twigs out the way because she's got to find lots to eat. See them eating leaves and bars. And kids, girls, you can ask me any questions you like about what we're seeing here. I'll be very happy to tell you any answers or give you any answers that you might have. That one is probably older than you guys. I think you guys are sitting at around five. Oh, look, pushing the tree over. Naughty elephant. Naughty. Oh dear. Oh well, now, I'm sure many of you thought that's terrible for the tree, but it's okay, you know. Even though that elephant has pushed over the tree, the tree is not going to be very happy, but the termites that are going to feed on the tree now, and the beetles that will go and eat the wood inside, they're very happy. And even though the tree has been pushed over, and even though that elephant has not eaten anything of the tree, it will probably still survive. Now oh, there's a very large elephant. She's a huge, huge elephant here. Hello, Hannah. You want to know why elephants need trunks? Well, Hannah, you have a nose, of course, and you know what your nose is for. It's for smelling things. And that's one of the things that the trunk has to do. It's used for smelling things. It's also used, if you watch them carefully, to pick things up off the ground. They can't bend over and put their mouths to the floor, and so they need their trunk to eat. Do you see that? She moved that piece of bush out the way. She'll be picking up little pieces of grass. She also drinks with her trunk. It's like a huge straw. She sucks water up into the trunk, and then she sprays it into her mouth. And I also know that many of you will be starting to learn musical instruments this year. You won't be... I think you're all a bit young to be learning the trumpet yet, but that trunk is like a big trumpet. And when the elephant is very cross, then she will blow it and it'll go... And it sounds like a loud, loud trumpet. I'm not going to make a big noise here, though, because we are very close to this elephant now. Hello, Sienna. You want to know how long these little babies stay inside their mummies? Well, they stay inside their mummies 22 months. Now, that's almost two years. Now, I think you guys are all about five years old. So it's almost half as long as you have been alive. They keep the babies inside the stomach. Two years, so you've got to go. Can you, you know how long it takes for you to get from one birthday party to the next birthday party, and how how long it takes to get from one Christmas to the other, and it seems like forever and ever. Well, imagine two of those. That's how long an elephant youngster is inside its mum. And we call an elephant mum a cow, and we call an elephant baby a calf. Now, Nina and Gabby, you're wondering about the horns. There are no horns here. Those are tusks, OK? So everyone say tusks, and then what I want you to do is put your hand to your mouth and touch your two front teeth. Can you all do that? Touch your two front teeth. I'm going to tap my two front teeth. There, I'm tapping them now. Those two front teeth, everybody, are exactly what those tusks are. It's just that they've grown very, very long. So you can imagine your two front teeth that we were just tapping there, growing all the way out of your mouth. Now this cow is coming quite close so I might have to start the car and move but we're just going to sit very quietly so everybody be very quiet because we don't want it to get cross with us we want it to be very relaxed and we want it to be very calm so just whisper be very quiet everyone. Are you all being very quiet? Shh.
Hello, Suri. You want to know why they need such big ears? Well, you can hear me whispering so we know that they can hear very well. But one of the reasons is to stay cool. Those ears help them to stay cool. The blood flows through their ears and the blood gets very cool when they flap the ears and then that blood goes into the brain. Look how strong they are! Now, I won't go to sit with these elephants for a bit longer, but my very good friend Byron has found Africa's most fearsome cat. Go and have a look. That's right, James. We have found some fearsome cats. We are sitting with a pride of lions. It's a lioness over there. And hello again to the Rodine girls. The great Nord class of Mrs. Hedgehog and Mrs. Squirrel, or Madam Hedgehog and Madam Squirrel. Welcome. It's so nice to have you with us. We've been sitting with these lions from early this morning. We heard them calling during the night and they made a kill. And these lions are feeding on what is left of a little buffalo that they killed. A big male is eating. The, there was another male. His brother was with him. But he has moved off and he's lying not too far from here. But look at that. That big male is still eating, having his breakfast. It's great to have you, all of you young girls with us. Don't forget to send us your questions. Get your teachers to send us your questions. And myself or James will gladly answer them. So happy you got to see that elephant too. Oh, that's one of my favorite animals. I love seeing elephant. But the, these beautiful lions are warming up nicely in the sun. Look at that lioness at the back. Really enjoying the morning sun. I hope you are all warm in your classrooms at the moment. It was very cold this morning. I still have my beanie and my gloves on. And I can stay warm. But the sun is starting to help us nicely. Look at that beautiful golden mane of that male. Very, very big male, beautiful lion. He's been enjoying this kill for quite some time now. He's been feeding for about, I'd say, 20 minutes, half an hour. still tearing little bits and pieces that he can get. Oh, look at that. Have a look and see how he's feeding. He's turned and using the side of his mouth. Do you see that? And it's very interesting. All the big cats do that because they have got very, very sharp teeth at the back of their mouth that act almost like a, so a sharp scissor that they can cut and tear the meat. And that is where all the power is. There are a lot of muscles in the back of their jaw. So they're able to eat very, very well with those teeth. And they use those sharp front teeth to tear open any meat that they are trying to eat or any carcass. So Gabriella has asked us a question, why must the lioness wait for a meal while the male eats? So Gabriella, the reason for that is the male, and it happened earlier, but he is quite aggressive and very stingy with sharing his meat. He does not want to share with that lioness. See, with all these lions and most animals, for survival they need a lot of food. And these males... They don't like sharing their kill if they are eating and the lioness will wait patiently until that male is finished and if he moves off if there's a little bit left she will then be able to feed but while he is eating that small piece she will not go close to him at all because he will get aggressive and often swipe or bite that female with the lionesses though if they are together the lionesses will feed on the kill at the same time, but with these big males, they don't like the females coming too close while they are feeding. So 
So Zoe has asked us a question, why do lions have tails? So Zoe, lions have tails for a number of reasons. And there you can see that big male's tail very clearly. So one of the reasons would be when they are hunting, it helps give them a bit of balance while they are running. It helps just gives them a little bit of agility. That means they can move a bit easier while, while they are running at high speeds and they'll swing their tail from side to side to help balance them a little bit. The other thing is it's, it's, a, it's used to warn any potential threat or potential danger. If lions are upset or aggressive, they flick the tail from side to side very quickly and they'll give a very loud growl and that's a warning and saying stay away I don't want you to come any closer. The other thing is possibly flick flies away off their back they'll flick their tail up and swish it around chasing flies so there are a number of reasons why lions have tails. The lionesses will also use it if they are getting cubs to follow them So while they are walking, they can lift their tail up, the cubs can see it, and they can follow it. And will follow the females. Dina has asked us, why do lions have manes? So the big males all form these beautiful, beautiful big manes. And the reason for that is it protects them. So it's also to attract females. Big, long, hairy manes may attract the females to the males, make them more attractive but the main reason is for protection males constantly fight with each other for dominance and for territory so they've got these thick coats or thick manes to protect them that if they fight or bite each other around the neck or the head there's a lot of hair so hopefully they won't get as badly injured as they would if they didn't have it so that is probably the main reason why lions have manes Look how he's licking that kill, probably trying to clean it, that little piece of meat that he's got left there. He's got a very, very rough tongue. Lions and other big cats too, but especially lions, they've got little hairs on their tongue and it's very, very rough. If they were to lick your skin, they could lick your skin off within a few minutes. And you can see how that he's probably trying to get rid of some of the hair that is on that young buffalo. You can see he's spitting some out there. So you can get to the good meat underneath. We're gonna sit with these with these lions a little bit longer. It's a really, really wonderful sighting. While I do that James has got some spotted friends for you. Look everyone, there is a spotted hyena. Now I know that most of you have seen the Lion King and you've seen that the spotted hyena is supposed to be a nasty, thieving, cunning, horrible animal. Well nothing could be further from the truth. The hyena, spotted hyena, is a magnificent creature. This is a mum, and she's just had two tiny little babies, and they're just inside this termite mound that she's living in. You see this huge mound of earth, and sand, and trees? This is a termite mound, and it was built by millions of little termites, which I suppose are a little bit like ants in appearance, but they're not related to ants. But this was built by millions of them. How many years ago, we can't even tell. Look at all the trees growing out of this termite mound. Much, much more ancient than you, much more ancient than your parents, much more ancient than your grandparents either. And inside it, you can see a couple of holes, and they were dug by a very special animal called an artfark. Okay, I'm going to count to three, everyone, and then you're going to say artfark. Ready? One, two, three.
Hart Fark. Once more with Brian this time. One, two, three. Hart Fark. <laughs> now, an Hart Fark actually means earth pig. And its other word name is an ant bear. And it's got very sharp claws, and that's what it uses to dig the holes. And then, when it's finished eating the termites, then the hyenas come, and they give birth just inside the holes. And the holes keep their babies warm and safe from other predators, like those lions. Those lions don't like hyenas very much. And leopards and other hyenas. And we're just going to sit here for a little while and hope that maybe one of the tiny little babies will come out. Caitlin, you are obviously a very clever little girl and you've travelled to the bush before and you say, why are baby hyenas darker? Well, it's because they spend so much time in the shade. So you can imagine if you lived in a dark hole somewhere and you didn't want to be found by something, what would be the cleverest colour that you can be? If you want to move around at night time and you don't want to be seen by anything, black is the best clothing to wear. And that's the same reason that a hyena baby is black. Then when they get a bit older, they turn the colour of their mum there. And she's very well camouflaged for walking around in the bush, especially in the early morning and the early evening. When the light isn't so good, those colours that she's got there are very good at keeping her camouflaged and hidden away from anything that she might want to eat or that might want to attack her. But the little ones live inside their holes. Oh, she's seen something. See how she's up and she's looking. She's smelling. She's got great ears. You can hear lots of things. She's got brilliant eyes, much better than our eyes. And an amazing, amazing nose. Now you know that your nose, when you smell something nice and you know when you smell something horrible, well, a hyena has a much, much stronger nose than even yours and so she can smell things up to three kilometers away. Now, some of you will live, well, I mean, that's like you being able to smell your house from where you're sitting right now. Isn't that amazing? Now, we've got a question from, I think, Beyoncio, is, is that correct? Ioncio. Ioncio, what an interesting name that is. Um, you want to know why they've got spots well, Yonsio, they've got spots for the same reason that the little ones are black. It's for camouflage. Now, I don't know if you know what camouflage is, but camouflage is the ability that an animal has to hide uh, in plain view. And what that means is that even though the hyena might be very close to you, you wouldn't be able to see it. If it was in some thick bush, it would be camouflaged. It would be almost impossible to see. And those spots help it to be camouflaged. Now, I wonder how many of you have seen a soldier, maybe not in real life, but perhaps on TV, a soldier, you know those clothes that a soldier wears that look like they've got bits of bush printed on them, or in those khaki or green colours? Well, that's called camouflage as well. And it's we've taken that idea from nature. Many of the things we do as human beings, we take the idea from nature, and hyenas and leopards and lions and Nyala and Zebra have been camouflaged for thousands of years before we decided to copy them. So that's why they spotted Yonsio. Oh, Caitlin, very nice question from you. You say, how old are the babies in the hole? Caitlin, the little babies in the hole, you wouldn't believe it, are only two weeks old. That's 14 days. Just 14 days old. And unlike, I don't know how many of you have got little baby brothers and sisters who are only 14 days old, but you know a 14-year-old baby, human, can't do anything. All it does is cry when it wants to eat. So that's what we all did when we were 14 days old. A baby hyena, 14 days, can run around, it can play with its brother or sister, there are two of them in there, and we don't know if they're boys or girls yet, and they can play with their brother or sister, they can play on their mum, 
they can climb around on the mound, they've got fully developed teeth, they can see well, so they're very, of, they're very well developed, even at just 14 days old. You can see she's very tired, and that's because many, many animals out here are what we call nocturnal, that means they're active during the night. Okay, you guys have got to go and learn something else now. I hope you have a wonderful day at school. Madam Hedgehog's class, Madam Squirrel's class. There's the thumb saying goodbye to you, and he's, the thumb is saying, learn very hard, especially you, Sienna. Work very hard today. Have a marvellous day, kids, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Just listening, everyone. Seemed like. Can you hear that? We'll just turn up the ambient sound a second. I wondered if it wasn't the baby hyenas calling from inside. We're going to sit here for another five or ten minutes. I think it's going to be worthwhile, uh, especially while we have the lions there. So let's head back to, um, to Barry and the lions, and uh, we'll see you just now. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, sitting with the hyena over there. <laughs> We're still with the lions. That male lion just picked up a little leg from that buffalo calf. This male has been feeding for a good half an hour, 40 minutes now. Not, not given up just yet. He's getting every little piece of meat he can get from that from that little carcass and again I think these lionesses that lioness at the back I think she is possibly responsible for the kill her and there must have been one or two other lionesses around that helped to kill this young buffalo I think they fed for a while but the males probably heard the distress calls or alarm calls and they headed into this area and I think they've pushed away those adults, all those lionesses, and they started feeding. Only the one male when we got here this morning was feeding, and it looked like he had been feeding for quite some time. I think he got most of the good meat, and as he moved off, this male then moved in to start feeding. So I don't think they fed early on in the evening. I think these lionesses killed this around half past 10 or 11 o'clock last night, got to feed, and the males came in early, early this morning, early hours of this morning and chase them off and have started to feed and finish up the kill. So Sarah from Austin, Texas has asked or she read an article about a lioness that has a mane and she asked if I've ever heard of this. Sarah, I have and I've actually seen that lion and it is in an area in Botswana, in the middle of Botswana, the central part of Botswana, known as Mombo. That was, that was kind of where the, this lion was first seen and its territory was in and around that area. So this lioness for some reason I think just had a, a higher testosterone level and it started to grow a mane, and it did, it grew a mane. So it was very, very interesting, and it was quite confusing for a lot of the lions. Often males would run in and just see this lion, and think, well, that's, that's another male, and would often act quite aggressively towards her, and then realize that it is, in fact, a female. So it's very, very interesting, um, that, that situation. It's not something that I've seen anywhere else. I've only seen it there. And I don't really know, I think it's genetics and the hormones that, that have affected that lion for some reason. And she has grown a male, um, a mane, <laughs> she's not grown a male, she's grown a mane. But interestingly enough, and uh, I have read up and found in other parts of Africa, we've had male lions that haven't grown manes. They look very much like lionesses, only little tufts of hair around the head. That has happened in the past too. So I think it's area specific. Might be a deficiency in what they are eating. They're not getting enough nutrients. Um, perhaps lower testosterone levels. There could be a number of different reasons. 
but that lioness did grow a mane and I have seen it. It's incredible. It's one of the joys of being able to take guests all over southern Africa and Africa. We do get to see different areas and different animals and we get to experience very different behavior which is area specific and every area within southern Africa is quite different. You get different animals occurring in certain areas and the behavior depending on where they are is also different. Botswana also has lions which are used to swimming because there's a lot of water in the delta and they, they've got to swim to get from one area to another so they cross through very deep water at times and I don't think I've ever seen lions in this part of South Africa in the Sabi Sands where we are ever really cross through a deep river or into a water hole because they don't need to but if if these animals need to do something they will they will adapt completely to their surroundings D. Reza has just asked us a question, do lions feed on birds and fish? Um, D. Reza, a good, good question. I have seen lions, and again, in times of drought, if, there's, if food is scarce, lions may feed on barbel or the catfish, which we get in this area. When these water holes begin to dry up, you get a lot of, a lot of catfish struggling to to move around in the, in, the, in the mud and the sludge and they get caught out on the bank and often lions will go and catch those catfish and feed on them. Uh, in terms of birds, I haven't seen lions feeding on birds but I'm sure they would if they, had to, if they managed to catch one. It's not always that easy to catch a bird but maybe a larger bird like a, a Franklin or a guinea fowl, I'm sure they would. I've seen leopard many times feeding on it, on birds like that. So. There's no reason why lions wouldn't, but generally lions would prefer something more substantial. But I've seen lions feeding on something as small as a scrub hare, a little hare which we get in this area. So, you know, they are opportunistic. If there's something around, they'll feed on it. No reason why they wouldn't. So Nevin from Australia has asked us a question why it is that females don't defend their kills. So Nevin, I don't think it's a case of them not defending their kills. They, they will defend their kills against other predators like hyena or, or a leopard or wild dog if they ran through. You know, these lionesses would definitely chase those animals away and defend the kill. But the, the thing is, when these big males come into an area or, or a situation like this where the females have got a carcass, it is not worth trying to defend it. They may put up a little bit of a fight, but at the end of the day, these males are bigger, stronger, and more powerful than those females. So they've got to be very careful. They, they would generally prefer just to leave it, let the males feed, and when the males are finished, they will then be able to feed. It's not worth trying to protect a carcass from a male and potentially get very badly injured. It causes them potentially not to be able to hunt again. So they have to be careful. But as I mentioned, I think what happened with these lionesses is they did get to feed earlier on last night. And when the males came in, they then eventually had to move off the kill. So Grass Mutin has asked us a question, how long lions would sleep for during the day? 
Now, that that is, I think, very much up for debate. The, the general general idea is that lions can sleep up to 20 or 22 hours a day. They can rest a long time, but it does completely depend on the situation and the area that they're in. I think lions would probably rest mainly during the the, the daylight hours, so from about 7, 8 o'clock in the morning as it starts warming up till about probably 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. And then they are generally more active later on in the evening. And the reason for that is it's cooler. It's better for them to move around when it is cooler. They, they use less energy. And also, they like moving around under the cover of darkness because it's easier to hide and stalk prey in the dark. They will hunt during the day too, but it makes it a bit easier at night. Like we can see, this is how they got this young buffalo carcass or buffalo calf. So it's it's tough to say, but I, I would say they probably rest for a good 12 to 18 hours a day uh, on average. And then depending in winter, when it is cooler, they probably move around a lot more because it's not as hot and it's more comfortable to move around during the day. But in the heat of summer, they will definitely rest from about 7 to 6 or 7 in the evening. They will definitely, definitely rest for long periods of time in summer. I'm going to spend a little bit more time with these lions and see if this lioness doesn't get some food shortly. While we do that, cross over to Sir James Henry and hopefully he has an update for you. That's very kind there of Berwick to send us across and with such kind thoughts. We have got two kinds of animals here for you. Uh, would you want to choose which one you want to see? We've got a uh, buffalo over there. There they are, Brian. Do you like the buffalo? I love the buffalo. Just up ahead, we've got elephants. That's how we roll in this part of the world. Animals on tap. You know how many animals we've had of late, yeah, Brian? Thanks, well, quite the opposite in the last few days. But now the universe has blessed us very richly. Look at that, everyone. There's an elephant over there. And just in ahead of us, a breeding herd of buffalo. Hello, X-Blade. <laughs> That's an interesting Twitter handle. Um, you say, how strong is elephant hide? Well, elephant hide is probably about four inches thick in some places. So you can imagine how tough that must be. I mean, I imagine it's probably one of the, it's the toughest leather you can find. And I think it's probably completely unworkable as well. So it's very, very tough indeed. But what's interesting, apparently, elephant skin is not waterproof. So it's water resistant, but unlike your skin, which is impervious to water, an elephant's skin is not apparently, and I'm not really sure why that is, but they also don't have sweat glands. And that's because they cool down much more easily than we do. They don't have such variable body temperature. And that contributes, I think, to the thickness of their skull. Now you can just hear, I'm going to be quiet very briefly. Now there's a whole herd of elephants, you know what? I think it's going to be worth, we're very close to Bifflesook Dam everybody. These buffalo I think are making their way down there. It sounds to me like there are more elephants heading down to the dam. We're not far from there, so I'm going to suggest we pop across to the dam straight away. What do you say Brian? You say a good idea, don't you? Good idea. Yeah, excellent. There we go. Let me just try and not reverse into something. There we are. We're okay. Hello, James Richard. 
difficult question. You say, are there individual Shangan words for the attributes that animals have, e.g. trunk of an elephant? Yes, there are. Um, I don't know what they are for, well, that specifically, I'm not sure what that is. But I imagine it's probably very similar to the word for nose. Um, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think... It would be exactly the same as the word for nose, I imagine. I'm just trying to think. Uh, a lion's mane. That's a similar word to the word for... Um, for beard. So if you say someone... Inamandevu, he's got a big mane. He's got a big beard like a lion, is basically what it means. But the word in Zulu, for example, for beard and mane, I think are two different words, so they're not the same. But there will be different words for different attributes, but probably not as many as there are in English. But, certainly I know in Zulu, there are, you know, every single bird's got a different species name, same as they do in, uh, in Shangan. Just looking at the ground, there's some hyena tracks heading this way. Well, the dam is just over here. Um, and interestingly, you know, when I, I spent a little bit of time in the Congo, uh, in the Democratic Republic thereof, and I was talking to some local people there. They only have one word for antelope. They only have one word for monkey, despite the fact that there are more than 10 species of primate monkeys there. And that was in one specific area. And I think it's because the area has been so denuded of animals over the course of the logging that's gone on there and the, the wars and the terrible time that they've had that the individual words for these animals have been lost, which is deeply distressing, I think. We've come down to the dam and there's, there's not a sausage in sight. We might have to go back to our buffalo and our elephant there. We'll just go on to the wall here. Oh, there is, however, an endangered bird. There it is. It's a saddle-billed stork, everyone. I'm going to stop over here. I don't want to startle the thing. And what I think we're going to find is that we're going to see more and more and more of these storks. We're going to get marabou storks popping down here very soon. There are going to be an increase in fish eagle visits to this area as this water gets shallower and shallower and probably the odd catfish arrives. Now I don't know how many of you have been watching of late but we've been at the Arethusa Dam quite recently and we know that there are possibly thousands of catfish in there. Enormous things, some of them up to four feet long. There aren't the same here. And it's interesting because, of course, Biffles Hook Dam dried out before it, the brief rain that we had at the beginning of the year, and it filled up a little bit. And I'm sure that there are small catfish in here, but there are none of those behemoth-like four-footers that you're finding there in the Arethusa Dam. And if the Arethusa Dam dries out, which I think it is very likely to, uh, um, for long enough, then those, those big fish will die and... Well, who knows when they'll come back again. So I, I don't see any kind of bubbles or very few bubbles rising to the surface here. So I don't know for sure um, if there are any catfish here. And if there aren't, or if there are, there must be very little. Brian, I know we don't have the super zoom camera, but there is the most beautiful little flock of yellow-fronted canaries sitting at the edge of the dam there behind. There, they've just flown off into the Zizifos tree there. We really needed the big super zoom camera. That was stunning. They're in there. You can just see little flashes of yellow in the tree there. I can't hear any more elephant movement. Yes, I can. Can I? Something's moving in the bush here. Ah a red-billed hornbill. And you can hear a virtual starling. They, they're the canaries, and you can maybe even hear them going...
<clears throat> Hello, Flaming Fox. What a lovely Twitter handle that is. The Flaming Fox, everybody, would like to know how many dams or waterholes there are here at Juma. Well, there's Buffalsook Dam here. There's twin dams down to the south. There is Treehouse Dam to the east and the uh, west, and there's Juma Dam in the centre where you had the lions earlier this morning. So that makes four, if I'm not mistaken. And then there are a number of pans, some of them natural, some not. Well, there's one not. That's uh, the artificially pumped pan that is in front of the Juma Dam. That one is pumped when there's no water in the Juma Dam itself. And then. Uh, there are a number of natural pans which hold water after heavy rain, and they'll hold water sometimes for months. So that's the sort of water there is here. So quite a lot after, you know, after a lot of rain, there's lots and lots of water being stored. Isn't that a lovely sighting? Look at the delicate way it walks. Incredibly careful about where it puts its feet. And there are some birds, and I'm not sure if this is one of them, but some of these wading birds like this can feel. So they move like that in order to disturb the fish. And they are so sensitive on the foot that if a fish flushes from underneath their feet, they stab down extremely accurately where they think it's moved and that's how they catch the fish without sighting them because they obviously can't see through the surface of this murky murky water and I think that that saddle-billed stork is looking for fish in the mud there I'm going to check something. I'm going to check what else they eat because I think it's quite interesting that it's sitting there. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I can't see any obvious signs of fish, so I'm not con entirely convinced there are any here. Righty, food mainly fish, also frogs, reptiles, small mammals, birds, crustaceans, and aquatic insects. So I think what it's going for there is probably a lot of um, aquatic insects you'll find. Maybe the odd snail. I don't think there'll be any small mammals under there, do you, Brian? Potentially, mm. not. Potentially not. Miniature dam dolphins. <laughs> Underwater bats. I really thought that the elephants were going to pop down here. They might do, but I can hear absolutely no sign of them. There's beefies might come down as well, but they were a little ways off. You can hear them in the distance going Bleh. I think it might be worth sitting here until they come. All right, let's go and update with the lions. I'll make a decision as to whether we're going to stay here or not, and also just find out if we might not get one last look at Karula's cubs this morning uh, before we go back. And these lions have not moved too much. They still, the male is still feeding. He's literally got the last little, little piece of meat there. Still crunching away. He's really enjoyed that buffalo calf. I can see some elephant in the distance walking towards the waterhole too. This poor lioness has had no luck to get more food from this male. <laughs> oh, beautiful yawn, look at that. But as it starts to warm up now, I think these lions are going to potentially move off into the shade somewhere. I don't think they're going to move too far. And... I'm sure they will go and drink at the water a little bit later. Let's just see what this lioness does if she tries to get too close to this male. Have a look here quickly. Let's see if we hear any growl from that other male or from that male. It 
see she's very cautious, very, very cautious of approaching, but it's almost not worth it. She'll rather sit and wait. Yeah, she's going to lie down. Another growl. This elephant are all heading down towards the, the dam or the water hole. Why don't we move down there quickly? As I said, I don't think these lions are going to move too much today. It's going to get nice and warm and with full bellies, they'll probably hang around there and I'm sure we'll get to see them later this afternoon too. Hopefully, and maybe we like and we get some some lions roaring for us later. That would be fantastic. Let's quickly make our way to those elephant. I think I saw some youngsters. I could just see them in the distance. Let's go have a look. Really lovely sighting with these lions this morning. Glad we got to find them so early. Oh, there we go, they're all there at the waterhole drinking. Nice big herd. And yeah, it looks like a lot of babies. So Flaming Fox has sent us a question. They would like to know, do elephants have a breeding season? No, they do not. And they can breed any time of the year. Whenever the females come into estrus, the males will then try and find them, mate with them, and the elephant then have a 22-month gestation period. Very, very long gestation period. And they will give birth any time of the year. That's why you have so many different ages with the elephants. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm just going to try to give them a little bit of space and go park on the other side. So we can see them drinking clearly. Oh, look at that little one. Tiny, tiny little guy. Wonderful. Look at that. <laughs> As it started to warm up, it's a perfect time for them to come and have a morning drink. They will move off, go and feed during the day and probably head back to the water hole a little bit later, one that they find. I just want to try something for you quickly. I want to just change our vehicle position a little bit. See if we don't have, they're very relaxed, these elephants. Very, very relaxed, enjoying that water. Just see if we don't get a few walking quite close to us. It's always wonderful to have elephant walk past. Let's just see, and it's a nice view from here too, of the trunks dipping into the water. Look at that young one on the other side there. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> so from leopard cubs earlier this morning to elephant calves. So Sarah has asked us a question, how fast can elephants run? So Sarah, if I remember correctly, oh, a bit of a trumpet there. Uh, if I remember correctly, a charging elephant can reach a speed of, I think it was around 
45 kilometers an hour. They can reach that speed quite easily. And that's very fast. Ah, there we go. One walking quite close to us. Have a look to our left. There's one smelling us right here. Hello. <laughs> just a, a little warning, but she's not too faced. She just came to smell. Make sure we're not, not a threat. It's just a little shake of the head and the flap of the ears to say, don't try and come too much closer. We've got young elephant here. And the females are very protective over the herd and the youngsters. If we're lucky, we might get one of the youngsters walking up to us. They can sometimes get a little bit curious and inquisitive. They might come and sniff around. It's amazing to watch these younger elephants. They learn from the adults so quickly. So Kathy from Tennessee has asked if she wonders if the lions can, see, if the elephant can see the lions. That is, and no, Kathy, I don't think they can. The lions are actually about, I would say, just over a hundred meters from where we are, about a hundred meters away. Um, but they are in an area where there's a little bit of thick vegetation. There are some trees, some trees, covering them. So. Even now, while I'm scanning around, I can just see the male, the one male, but he's about 100 meters away. But I don't think the elephant have seen him just yet. And because he is quite far, he's no threat to them, so they, they're probably not too phased. But I don't think they have seen him yet. Usually what happens is, elephant, if they do see predators, especially lions and that, they will go and chase them, and they chase them away. <laughs> a little trumpet from a young one. So Felix has asked, what would I do if the elephant charged us? So Felix, I would leave David on the vehicle and I would run. <laughs> no. <laughs> what I would do is probably just sit tight hold our position the reason for that is generally the elephant will give a mock charge it's unlikely that they will give a full-blown charge but the nice thing about elephant is you can read their behavior or you you get um, I suppose with more experience you get used to reading behavior quite easily and you can tell if they are un unhappy and if elephant do look unhappy then you generally just keep keep your distance don't get too close let's have a look at this female and see if she comes any closer. Look at that youngster trying to drink, suckle from the front uh, or from a mammary gland from the teats that are situated under the front legs. You see that? So if an elephant had to charge, I'd probably just sit tight, hold my ground. If they got a little too close, making a noise can sometimes help if you clap your hands or hit the side of the vehicle, but I prefer not to do that generally. I just try and avoid a situation like that and not cause the elephant to be aggressive or, or upset them in any way. You know, at the end of the day, we purely have to view them and appreciate these animals. We don't want to cause them to feel threatened or upset. Again, you can never be sure, but if you generally try to keep your space and keep your distance and allow them to approach you, they are generally more, more relaxed and happy with you being around. These are very relaxed at the moment. They're not phased by us at all. Look at this baby coming through. Oh, look at that. So cute. It's tiny. That is wonderful. See how they all almost protect that young one move around, stay close together. It is still a very, very young elephant. So they are 
I'm very careful when walking around with it. It'll be interesting, the rest of the, the herd have moved off further down the road and still no sign of them noticing that there are lions in the area. I would have thought perhaps they would pick up on a smell, but it all depends on which direction the wind is blowing. As I said, they're about 100 meters away, so it's not like they are very, very close. And it smells like the wind is blowing from the elephant up to the lions. So the lions would know that the, li the elephant are here. So, so Virginia from Kentucky has asked us, do the young elephant use their mouth or their trunk to nurse? In Virginia, they use their mouth. They lift their trunk back, they fold it back out of the way, and then they will suckle with their mouth. Off they go to feed for the day. What a lovely sighting. I love seeing elephant and spending time with them. Just wait for these two at the back just to move off a little bit further and then we will move too. What a great sighting. All herd has just stopped over there. Not too sure if they've smelt anything or maybe they can sense lions in the area or maybe picked up on the scent of some lions. I've spotted James on the other side of the dam. Looks like he is potentially going to try and get you another view of some leopard and cubs. There's James. <laughs> oh dear, he's going to try and drive something again. Is he? Uh, greatness. I do apologize for James, everyone. <laughs> I think he's, he's needing some, some coffee and breakfast, perhaps. <laughs> James was waving so profusely at us. Why don't you go across to him and get an update and see what he's up to? That's a very kind link there from Bertram. Thank you, Bertram. Well done. Nice elephants. Now, everybody, we stopped here mainly because Bertram was parked the other side there uh, with his friend. Uh, is he being filmed by um, Duncan? Duncan, yes. Duncan and Bertie, the other side there. And we've come back into this area because we have space to get into Karula again. So I think we're going to move in there. If, uh, I mean, unless you're tired of looking at Karula and her babies. Shall we go? For Let's go and have a quick look. I think that Byron slash Bertie is probably <laughs> heading towards the lions again. Uh, I'm just going to quickly contact Andrew. Go ahead. I'm just listening. Copy, thanks. Good morning, good morning. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everybody. So we're going to go in from a different angle this time. I think the sun will be extremely bright from where we looked last time. Now, she's just through here. We're going to ease our way back down through here. 
I'm just listening on the radio uh, to uh, reports of the dogs, and it seemed that they were heading in a southerly direction back towards Wilfelswick Dam, but they've changed. So I think we'll just stick with our Lepardo. So we know where she is. Magnificent queen. Now, for those of you, I don't think I've said this today, Karula, of course, a 12-year-old female leopard, and she is the bulk of our leopard viewing, and many have been watching her for, I think, probably up to nine years now, enjoying the different sights and trials and tribulations of the life of a leopard in the Sabi sand. And, of course, this particular area, some of the best leopard viewing you'll find anywhere in the world, if not the best. Ease our way around here very slowly. Now, Andrew said if we wanted to see the cubs, we should come around this way, Karula the other way. I think let's try and see the cubs, just simply because, well, they are so very special to see. Not that the queen isn't special. Not so bad. We don't want to get ourselves into trouble. I got myself into a lot of trouble, everybody. The first time I saw Karula, I said I thought she had a slightly pug face. Well, that was not a good idea on my part. Some very cross people after I said that. Well, the kill. Where's the kill? Is it in that tree there? No, it's not. It's around the corner. I'm just going to see if we can't see the cubs. I don't know where they are. Can we go around. Yeah, I think we're going to go around this vehicle here. So now, oh, there's Karula. We can just see her there. You won't see her, but there you can see her. There she is. Okay, I have a quick look there, and now we'll go around the other side. There's a cub sitting on the top of this termite mound. <laughs> I'll just get you into a position where you can see them. You see there, Brian? Just on the top there. There we go. You can't see it. It is there, it's right on the top. I'm going to get around the other side. Hello, Doug in Connecticut. You, you ask a nice question about when the cubs will stop showing so much affection for each other. Um, you'll find at it, it, the same time that they change sort of size from each other when they hit puberty. So you'll find around about a year old, they'll stop being too friendly to each other. There you go, Brian, just at the top of the mound. We'll just have a quick look here. She's just around there. I'm sure we're both up there. There you can just see the ear twitching. See that? We're just going to keep easing our way around this way and see if we can get a better view. So, Doug, you know, as with, I think, many, many mammals, the playfulness of and uh, exuberance of youth, if you like, um, will start to diminish once puberty comes and adulthood sets in. And you may well find that they are never angry with each other, that they are never openly aggressive to each other, but they will avoid each other once they're both adults. So everybody, there is a lot of bush around here and I don't want to get too close and, and frighten one of them, so I'm going to go around this way. I'll be able to get through here. Ah, let's go down there. You 
see the ears poking up the top there, right? Let me just do that. There we are. Just there. I just want to give them a little bit of time to settle while we move around here. If you can believe it, those dogs have crossed to Biffle's Hook Dam. I don't know where Byron is. If he's close by, it might be worthwhile. There's the little leopard. I think oh, there's an elephant right here as well. I'm going to sneak forward. That's what the leopard's looking at. I'm just going to show you the elephant. Oh, look at this. Look, 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 look. There's Karula and the elephants coming towards her. And there's the kill. Uh, I was talking absolute rubbish. That is a diker. I was looking at the kill there. I thought it was a stem book to start with. But it is definitely a diker. Isn't this amazing? Two shot of elephant and leopard, and the cubs are around here. I don't know where the other cub is. Might possibly up in the tree there. Let's just keep an eye out. And you can see Karula not vaguely worried about the elephants. Doesn't seem to be in the least bit phased. There we go, she's now moving. forward. Look, look, look. going on where we were waiting at Biffles Hook Dam, everybody, is that the buffalo herd has arrived, the elephant herd has arrived, the wild dogs have arrived. It's okay, we've got three leopards. We'll be all right here, don't you think, Brian? <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. That is too precious. All three of them, the little family together. Isn't that awesome? Now, I'm going to just get a look at their eyes and see if their eyes have, in fact, changed. Just too fantastic. Cannot believe our luck today. Nevin, you're in Australia and you say you were in Kruger once and you came across an abandoned lion cub and you say, is it common? No, it's very uncommon, Nevin. It really does not happen a lot. It's very strange and it would probably have happened as a result of pressure or starvation, or the mother may have died. Well, they do cross suckle, but if the, pride was in some, if the pride was in some distress, then you'll find that they may have abandoned the youngster. Now look, these elephants are coming towards us. The little leopard cubs are sneaking up onto the top of the mound. This is too wonderful. Yeah. 
Yeah, their eyes haven't changed much, you know. That is definitely Charlotte we're looking at there, who's just jumping onto the back of the mound there. And she's just a little bit nervous of the elephants. Byron, everybody, uh, Bertie, is on his way to Buffalshook Dam. And with any luck, we're going to have dogs as well. Our blue butterfrog, a nice question from you. If the cub was in a tree, would an elephant approach the tree? I don't think these youngsters would. Um, they wouldn't be afraid of the of the cub. Um, I, they're not they're not overtly nasty to to predators. I mean, they know these leopards are here. They they're not worried about it. But at the same time, um, I guess an angry elephant bull, if he smelt predator in a tree, might try and push the tree over or certainly shake the cub out. But I think they'd have to be very very upset to do that. I don't think these youngsters and um, I don't think these young ones and the cows would, would be that. We can't sneak forward because this view of the cubs on top is going to be something else. Not to frighten anyone, elephant or cat. You got the cub there, Brian? This is just brilliant. What a day we've had. Travis, you want to know if I think an elephant can tell the difference between a lion and a leopard. Travis, I've got absolutely no doubt in my mind that they can completely. They don't like lions. There's absolutely no way they would tolerate lions sitting this close to them. No chance at all. Look at this elephant. Come clo right up close to us, only about five feet away. I don't know where to look. I've got a cub there, mum there, and elephant even closer. <laughs> this is so special. She's almost feeding off the vehicle. I can see the individual little pieces of skin there. They just don't care about us. It's so wonderful. They're paying us no attention whatsoever. And this is how you want to experience the wild. With the animals totally ignoring you, just getting on with their lives. <laughs> ah, this is too wonderful. All youngsters. I'm not sure where the rest of the herd is, but there will be more elephants. And these guys are just basically experiencing life, enjoying being around us, I think. Oh, there's a tiny little thing. A little bit more nervous of us. Oh, it's our, it's our friends. Brian, it's our mates. It's the... It's the missing trunk. It's the third trunk elephant cow. And Brian and I have spent a lot of time with these elephants. I don't know if they recognize us, but maybe there's an element of them recognizing us and not being worried about us. Oh, that's so special. Just shepherded the youngster away. They're the best elephant herd, this. Just the four of them. That is so cool. <laughs> I can't believe it.
<sighs> Fantastic. Byron is now doing roughly Mach 3 along the Buffalsook cut line to get to Buffalsook Dam before either the dogs move or we run out of time. We've got 20 minutes. I think you're going to have an amazing sighting there of wild dogs. That will bring the total uh, sort of animals seen on the drive. Buffalo, elephant, leopard, leopard cub, lion, lion kill, male lion, female lion, and wild dogs. That will probably register as one of the best drives we've ever managed to deliver, I feel. And I say we, I actually mean that the wilderness has delivered to us. There's our third trunk female. I think it's time we gave her a name, don't you? What do you think? 30 seems a little bit, um, <laughs> a little bit rude, yes. I don't think we can call her 30. No, not for a lady. Hey, Fem? Yeah, if I make your way. Um, the female is just this side where I am. Not sure you'll get space, but if you come the other side of the mound from where I am, you may get the cubs on the top. I'm just trying to help them into the sighting here. I don't know where the cubs are at the moment. Not with any luck. He'll give them a bit of a fright and they'll come over the side. <laughs> they don't like the movement. Mm, Lily Garden, we've been asked this a few times and it's a, it's a really interesting question. And we don't know, but you say, how, at what age is she going to stop giving birth? When will she be beyond breeding age? She's 12 now. She's had cubs. They, in theory, if they survive, will, the last one, the male, will probably go independent at about 18 months. And therefore, you know, she will then be, what will she be, about 13 and a half, almost, almost four, probably 14, actually. And by then, she'll be almost done breeding. I think she's probably got, if these ones live to, live to fruition, or live to independence, I think you'll find that she's got one more litter in her after this. Just guiding this chap in so that he can see the queen. The kill is in the tree behind you. She's just eyeing them out, deciding what she thinks of that lot. Now, the cubs, I think, are probably sitting on the top of the mound. Mm. Margaret, you're absolutely correct. You say on the scale of 1 to 10, I'm having an 11 day. I would say absolutely, possibly even a 12. Brian? 12 bordering 13. 12 bordering 13. <laughs> it is just too wonderful. Um, I can't see the cubs on the top canoe. I'm just going to peer to the top with my powerful binoculars. I can see a bit of moving grass, but I don't see the youngsters. Let me just ask her. Can you see the cubs? Okay. The kill is just behind you in the tree there.
just reverse a little bit and then you'll be able to get a view, a better view of the queen. See if we can't see the cabs on the top. I'm sure all these bushes weren't here when we came in, Brian. We've got babies at the back there. You got them on top. Amazing. I mean, that is only uh, maybe 12 meters from us, 30 feet, almost invisible. How's the other one gone the other side? Both on top there. That is so cool. Little ears looking. Fantastic. The queen's still sitting. I don't think she's going to move. In the meantime, let's just do another little maneuver and see if we can't get a slightly better view. Jim? Jim, a nice one from you about vultures. Will vultures go for that kill? Um, they might. They might settle in the trees around here. They're not, you know, vultures can't really perch. So for them to actually eat a kill in a tree would be very difficult. If it was just left there, yes, I suppose they probably would eventually sort of try and have a bit of a peck at it. But ideally, they need to eat on the ground. It is quite nicely hidden from the air, so I don't know that they'd be able to see it that well. But they may be able to see it and then they'd come and sit in the trees around here. But uh, they wouldn't ever go near Karula, for example. They wouldn't, if they saw her there, they'd sit in the trees and she would probably chase them off if they tried to go anywhere near the kill. Now, let's go back across to Byron, get an update from him as to what he's going to do with those dogs or if he's found them, and I'll stay here for the remainder of the drive. Hi everyone, so I'm in search of wild dogs. We've got an update that they crossed over onto Juma and I'm trying to rush around to find them. Wild dogs, when they do move through an area, they move through very, very quickly. No sign of them just yet. Let's just have a look along here. As I said, you know, they, they do run and hunt in the mornings and mornings like this, they can cover huge distances, huge areas when they are looking for food. I haven't got anything just yet for you. But let's see. So while I'm still on the search for wild dogs, head back to James and the leopard cubs. Well, there is the leopard cub, everybody. We've just moved around here. And you can see even a cub can be flat cat. Just like there's lions. And they will sleep, obviously they're very little, so they'll probably sleep even more than their mother does. And Karula is a very good sleeper. She's highly accomplished at sleeping. Not quite as accomplished as lions are at sleeping. They're the most accomplished sleepers in all of creation, I think. 
Brian, you're not a very accomplished sleeper, are you? No. Very poor sleeper, in fact. I must say, the after the morning now, of course, taking on that delightfully quiet, peaceful atmosphere. Michael, you want to know why some leopards are so relaxed around vehicles. Michael, it's from years and years and years of leopard viewing. In the Sabi sand, we have been viewing leopards now for probably 30 years odd, um, ever since the first mother leopard who... I don't know if you noticed Lex Hess, who was one of the guides driving around today here with us this morning. He um, and a couple of colleagues habituated leopards in the Sabi Sands around Londolozi many years ago. And it was those leopards, those original leopards, and the approach that they did, uh, the, or the approach that they took to habituating them, so spending extended periods in a vehicle with them, that eventually brought about this whole, basically an industry, based on the viewing of this cat. And it's just through time with the leopards that they became completely relaxed with the vehicles. And what you find is that the cubs take their cues from their mothers. So these two cubbies will be relaxed around cars as long as their mother is. It's the same with Shadow's, um, Shadow's cub, and it's the same with Karula's mother, and it would have been the same for her mother before her. And if you go into a new area and you don't see the leopards, or whether you haven't seen leopards before, they will run away from vehicles. They'll be terrified of vehicles. And it's a process of just showing that you mean no, that you have no threat, that you are no threat, by spending time away from them. You get a bit closer, you talk a bit, you make you know, so that they can hear the sound of the human voice and not associate it with danger. And then you go away again. And it's a long process. But once you've got a sort of suite of adults where they are relaxed, you can be almost certain that their cubs will take the cue from their parents and then you're into a situation like this where you've basically got great leopard viewing. Uh, well, I mean, if it's not once a week, or at least um, even on this small reserve, you know, we have pretty good leopard viewing probably two or three times a week, which, you know, initially in many wildlife areas is totally unheard of. But it's simply through time viewing them. It also does help, of course, that we have a situation where you can follow them off-road. So I was recently at Pinda, which is a stunning reserve down on the north coast of Natal. And Pinda uh, has a leopard concentration probably higher than Sabi Sand. But the, only, the reason they don't view them so well is because um, they can't drive off-road. You know, the, the terrain just doesn't allow for it. So if a, you know, if a leopard goes off-road here, well, it is a bit bumpy and we do kind of make a bit of a noise every so often, we can't do it. You know, you can get in, in amongst the trees, through the bushes, there's not a huge number of rocks around. A place like Pinda on the Waterberg of South Africa, beautiful, beautiful areas. But to drive off-road after them is difficult, which means that they don't ha get as habituated to us as they do here in the Sabi Sands. Botswana is another area where you can drive off-road very successfully in the delta, and the leopards there even though they have massive, massive concessions of, of space. The leopards there, especially at a place like Mombo, for example, the leopard viewing there is probably as good as it is here in the Sabi Sand. So we've only got a few minutes left. I'm hoping Byron is going to have some success there. But if he doesn't, at least we've had an unbelievable morning. <laughs> Let's go across to Byron quickly and get an update from him. I think it's a bit frustrating. So, no luck just yet with the wild dog. I've been having a look around very carefully. I don't see anything. No one has any sight of them. But that's, that's the way wild dogs move. They'll come through an area, they'll cross over very quickly and move in, have a look if there's any potential prey and move out just as quickly as they came in. But I'm not going to give up just yet. I just want to check this area carefully. Even if we find them after or once you have tuned out, then maybe this afternoon we're lucky and we might be able to show you some wild dog. That would be really great. So I'm just having a, a good look around. You never know, they could come running past us. 
and can be a little frustrating at times. James, you're right. But that's, that's how it goes. That's what happens. We've had a fantastic morning. We've had lions with a kill. We've had the leopards with a kill and the cubs. That, I mean, just incredible. Elephant. It's all been happening. It was what an exciting, exciting morning. And literally within, within a few kilometers of camp, very close to camp this morning. So we're very lucky and very happy. No, still no sign of any wild dog. I think they may have moved out of the area already. But it's warming up. So if we are able to find some tracks, we might be able to track them because as soon as it starts to warm up, they go and they lie down, rest, and they'll relax for most of the day. And then early this afternoon again, they'll probably get up and start moving around and hunting. You never know, we could potentially find them then. I hope you've enjoyed this morning with us. We've certainly had a fantastic morning with you and thank you for all the questions. Thank you to David on camera with me this morning. Always great to have David with us. And thank you to the ladies in the FC. We will see you all later this afternoon. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and thank you. Back we are, back we are with the leopard. And the leopard, I'm afraid, has not moved an ear since you were last here. Tiny little thing. I was saying earlier, probably about the size of a white highland terrier or a scotty dog. There's an ear movement, high action here. And mum will sleep the other side, and I think sometime during the middle of the day they'll go up and have a bit of an eat. Hmm. Hello, Gary. You say you've seen big cats jumping on vehicles. Gary, you may have seen that. It would have been cheetah, though. And it would have been cheetah probably in East Africa. And cheetah do that in East Africa because there's so little in the way of cover. There's also very little in the way of vantage points. And they hunt purely on sight there. And so they jump onto the cars for vantage. So they leap up onto the bonnets of the vehicles. They look around the place and they leap off again. Uh, it doesn't happen here. If a leopard was to jump onto your bonnet, it, and it's happened to me once, it is an absolutely terrifying experience. It's not jumping onto the bonnet for a vantage point. It's normally jumping onto the bonnet because it's so very, very cross. And you don't want to cross leopard around. So I'm aware there are almost no fatalities recorded or, you know, of cheetah attacking human beings. But with leopards, that is not the case. So they don't have the same relationship with us that cheetah do. Look how perfectly, perfectly hidden that leopard is. Wonderful. Right. We have had an exceptional morning. Thank you, Brian, Thank and your thumb. Your thumb did an exceptional job today. Big thank you to Bertram and Duncan on the other vehicle for their efforts today. To Kirsten Max Smith being ably assisted this morning, I think by Chelsea Bunn. I think it was Chelsea Bunn. Uh, wonderful to have you with us. And thank you to all of you for joining us for what was an utterly spectacular morning from the middle of Africa. We'll see you later at 3 o'clock this afternoon.